All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in on the premiere of tonight's episode about how to nature journal plants at a nursery. Now we're going to talk about how to nature journal plants in general. So I'm going to go over some major tips, whether you made it to that premiere or you didn't. I'm going to talk about some important things that you need to know to capture plants in your nature journal, even if you think you can't draw. Yes, we're going to talk about options for people who think they can't draw. So um, thanks for tuning in. And this is going to be all about how to draw plants, how to nature journal plants um, and incorporate them into our nature journals in a variety of ways. So I'm going to show you a few pages and then we're going to start doing some nature journaling together. You can draw along with me and we're going to use some techniques such as you might be noticing these very realistic drawings in my nature journal here. And these are actually pressed plants. So we're going to talk about that and a few other tricks. Here you can see a pressed plant and then some drawings of plants. There's a variety of ways you can incorporate plants into your nature journal, uh, whether you're using watercolor, ink, pressed plants. And I'm even going to talk about this secret method right here. So stay tuned for that. I'll be talking about some of the tools that I like best. I have to skip a few pages here because I can't show you everything. I'm going to show you some of the tools that I like best, including this amazing camera that you can clip on to your phone and get a lot closer focus. It's really amazing and affordable. I'm going to talk about a couple other things in addition to that, including the secret technique here. I'm not going to tell you what that is yet. And we're going to start off with some empowering techniques that are great for everybody, even if you think you can't draw. So yes, that's right. We're going to start with blind contour. I will also talk about how there are certain plants you probably um, should know are just going to be challenging subjects by themselves. So knowing that something is a challenging subject before you fail at drawing it and then blame yourself is really helpful because hopefully you'll blame yourself a little bit less or you'll know better um, if you ruin it trying to draw a plant like this. So we're not even going to try with this one. This might be a good place to use words um, or a photograph or maybe even uh, cyanotype type sun prints, which are actually rather convenient to bring in your nature journal kit. Uh, I think I have some right here. There are these kits. I'll post links to these later, but this type of thing um, would be one tricky way to nature journal a super complicated and hard to draw thing such as this. White uh, plants can also be very hard. For example, these spines right here are super cool and I can think of ways to draw them, but they are also a pale color, which is challenging to draw with watercolor on white paper. That might be a place for you to try using toned paper. Toned paper can stand out quite differently from the plant matter, so that can be useful. Black paper would be really good for pale subjects. So we're going to dive right in with a couple things. And what we're going to do first is blind contour drawing. So get your um, get your supplies ready. And I think we're going to actually start with something like that. Those look good. Uh, Mindy's here. Hi, Mindy. Post something in the chat. There should be a chat box over there. It's always really fun to see what people, what people post. And this is your opportunity to follow along and do a little bit of sketching, a little bit of learning how uh, to nature journal plants with a variety of techniques. And I have some uh, models here that we can look at. So let's start with um, these really simple ones here. So the basic idea with blind contour is you look at what you're drawing. You don't look at your drawing. <laughs> so I'll say that again. You look at your subject, but you don't look at your drawing. So what that means is you probably won't be able to lift your pen off the paper as you draw, I shouldn't be using this good of a, I should be using something else, but I don't know which one. Um, you don't wanna take your pen off the paper. So hold this somewhere far away. I'm actually gonna have to do it like over here. Hold one of these, hold whatever you're looking at. Like if you're looking at the screen, it'll be easy because you can just look at the screen and draw in front of you. Oh, Terry is here also. Um, but for me, it's a little bit more challenging because I'm going to be drawing ra rather close. But what you want to do is draw somewhere far away from where you're looking. Actually, maybe I'll just turn the page to, to make this um, easier. Or I'll, yeah, I'll turn the page. So I'll hold this over here and you can draw along with this one. 
I'm just going to hold it in this position. And you can see if you've never done this with me before, you can watch right now how I do it. So I'm trying not to look at my drawing. I'm trying to just look at what uh, I'm drawing, the subject. And that's one. So you can see it's kind of crazy and all over the place. And now I'm going to try another one. And I'm going to do it with my hand as well. So remember, these are a warm up and this is a trick. So this is for if you're worried that you can't draw plants at all, this is a good strategy to get started with. So those both look pretty silly. Let's try this one next. It looks like it got squashed inside of my ske sketchbook when I close the page. This is a good one for practicing blind contour. So I'm going to hold it here. Try to draw it without looking at your drawing. Just look at the plant. This is a warm up and a good practice tool for drawing. Okay, that one's crazy. So these are straight blind contour drawings. And as you can see, it can come out a little bit wonky, but that's fine. It's partly just a warm up. Now, one technique I highly recommend for uh, nature journaling plants is doing a modified blind contour. So instead of not looking at our drawing at all, we'll look back and forth at our drawing a couple of times, but we'll try to keep a little bit of that looseness that we got when we weren't looking at our drawing at all. So you'll notice I'm being a little bit um, wild with my line work, and I'm still kind of not really picking my pen up very much and using those return lines to add some character to the drawing. And this is what I recommend as a really easy technique for drawing plants if you're feeling like you can't draw at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to just get started that way with a basic, um, a, a basic blind contour, modified blind contour, and then we're going to watercolor that. So go ahead and do a couple of these until you get one that you're sort of somewhat satisfied with. I'm going to do another one with the, the pomegranate flower. So if you want to do another pomegranate flower one, here it is. Let's see if the camera will actually focus on this. Um, I'll just hold it there for like a minute. So go ahead and see if you can um, do a modified blind contour. Ooh, that one's too crazy. I'm going to do another one. See if you can do a modified blind contour of this pomegranate flower. Maybe the pomegranate flower is not the best subject. And remember, whenever you're feeling like something like this is not working or you don't like the way your drawings are coming out, one of the best solutions is to do many of them. Okay, so I should have mentioned to do this in a, a waterproof ink. Oh, wow, I just noticed there's a caterpillar on this California poppy petal. So this might be a good opportunity to see how the focus feature works way better on the um, camera that I'm using now, which is actually my phone. So glad that works. So this might be a good opportunity for me to even put on my, this is a close focus lens. And since I got distracted by a bug already, um, I'm going to see if I can put the close focus lens on here and show you the bug up really close. All right, let's see if you can see this caterpillar. And now of course it's not moving. But look at how that that um, macro lens, it just clips onto the phone and it works so well. I take photos of plants a lot of a lot of times I take photos close up using this and all you do is clip it onto your um, clip it onto your phone camera and it works really well. It's very affordable compared to other camera options. I'll put a link to this um, later in the description, but it's a really great tool for nature journaling plants. Just don't end up taking photos the whole time and not doing any drawing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to add watercolor to this. And this is something I've seen multiple people in the nature journaling community do really well. I've seen Kate Rudder make some really nice ones where after a blind contour 
drawing, adding a little bit of color to it, um, it, it can be really nice. So get your watercolor out here. Yes, Mindy, I think you would really like it. It's an awesome. I've taken it in a lot of jungle situations and deserts. So this is a good time to probably use um, a heavy hand with your watercolors because what we're going to do is we're trying to keep this a little bit lively here. And that's this is always blind contour and a little bit of watercolor it is a good strategy if you don't feel like you can draw or you think you can't draw and you're trying to get into nature journaling plants. But it's also a good strategy for people who are a little bit too uptight with their drawing um, or are perfectionists. I fall into that category and blind contour drawing is a really good way for me to relax. And as you saw in the nature journaling at a nursery video that just premiered, I used the a somewhat of a blind contour technique to get me started on that day in the nursery. And it really helped uh, because the, the procrastination and perfectionism can prevent you from ever pulling out uh, your, your nature journal in the first place. So now I'm gonna come in and try to get these flowers. It'd be good to do sort of a little bit of wet on wet. I think it might've dried slightly already. But as you can see, we're working very, very loose. And this is a great way to nature journal plants, especially if you're just getting started with nature journaling and you're afraid of drawing a plant. You'll also notice this is very bold. So for example, when I first started nature journaling, I always used a mechanical pencil and I would have spent the amount of time just spent right now, I probably would have gotten like this far. And this is all I would have to show for it. And it wouldn't even show up on the camera. So this is why I think if you notice that you're always doing drawings like that and you, you're you not capturing very much in the field or when you're nature journaling plants in like a live situation, um, you have less time, try working with ink, try using this blind contour method with watercolor. So that is just a kind of really easy way to get started with the drawing part of, of nature journaling plants. So now that you know how to uh, nature journal plants with a basic basic drawing like that, we're gonna skip into the next uh, the next way to nature journal plants. And that's gonna be, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, which is a such a great technique. So um, we could actually, I think might be really cool in this case to do it with something we're very curious or, about, or at least I'm, curious about in this case, and that is this um, California poppy petal. Uh, I guess it's two petals and this little creature that's on there. Um, actually, you know what, let's just focus on the the plant as a whole. And if the, the, the caterpillar comes up, that's fine. So we're going to do, I notice. I wonder, it reminds me of right now. It's the most, it's the only thing you need to remember for nature journaling, I would say. Um, I'm going to write write it out here real quick. Um, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, it's the most important thing to remember as far as nature journaling goes, in my opinion. It's such a powerful tool. I notice, I wonder... Okay, so first we're gonna start by making direct observations. And direct observations sounds really easy, but it's actually really different from the way um, we think and talk most of the time. So what you might notice is when you get started nature journaling plants, you might just draw a plant like this, and then you might write next to it like aloe vera. And that's fine, uh, but I think it's there's so many other things you can do with nature journaling besides just drawing a plant and then writing the the name next to it so i notice i wonder it reminds me of we're going to look at things and we're going to make direct observations so for example i'm going to write and go ahead and write some things that you notice into the live chat what do you notice um going on in this area so 
direct observations can be colors, they can be visual things, they can be shapes that you see, they can be numbers if you count things. Um, ideally, they're not going to be interpretations. So like if I said, I notice a California poppy, um, that's fine and that's true, probably true in this case, but it's a name for a thing is different from a direct observation. So I'm going to write a few things down. Go ahead and write some down on your own paper. If you're doing it on paper or write some in the chat. Um, I noticed there is a moving, a moving green thing. Thing. I notice shiny orange. I notice multiple shapes. These don't have to be complete sentences. And I think it's really good to train yourself to write in abbreviations. So for, for example, we'll do that now with the questions. So those are all some things that I noticed. Well, actually I'll do it right now. Instead of writing, I notice different colors. I'm just going to write different colors. So this sounds really kindergarten, but that's what a direct observation is, is saying I notice different colors is actually more true than you saying I notice a California poppy because you're not noticing a California poppy. That's your brain jumping to a conclusion based on the information you're getting. Um, so now we're going to do some questions. So Ivea, for example, is describing the shape of the petal and the way the color changes as you go along the shape of the petal. And that's something that might not, someone might not notice that if they're just calling it a California poppy and moving on to the next thing. So there is a color gradient that's really cool. So now I'm going to go on to questions. I'm going to say, um, what makes it shiny? That's a function question. I have a whole video about a taxonomy of questions that you can look up. What makes it shiny is sort of a function question. Now I'm going to ask a silly question. What is a flower? Oops, Google, Google Calendar. What is a flower or an obvious question? Um, I'm going to ask a relationship question and chemistry question in one. Is it edible? Pollinators, question mark. So you can see just being able to formulate a bunch of questions. Um, yay, International Nature Journaling Week starts tomorrow. Super exciting, everybody. And I'm going to try to make some videos about that later this week if I have time. Super exciting. This is an interesting question. Why are the petals lighter colored on the underside than the top side? Yeah, if there if there is a reason. Great questions. Um, and one thing is, as you ask questions, better questions will come. So go ahead and write down any question. You're not judging these questions on quality. You're just trying to go for quantity. And if you are interested in quality questions, um, they usually come after you've asked a couple um, less good ones. So for example, um, I started to wonder, you know, like something like what if the caterpillar, I'm assuming it's a caterpillar, um, hurts the plant, but the butterfly helps it. And then finally is it reminds me of, this is where you can bring in your outside information. So I'm gonna say it reminds me of California poppy or I could just write California poppy. I'm gonna write um, Papa Veracea, which is the family. I'll make a simil uh, a silly one. It, it reminds me of a hot metal slide at a playground. OK, 
connecting new information to memories we already have helps with um, our memory and our retention. So, um, so now look at this. This is kind of crazy to tell you the truth, but look at this page right here. And what you'll notice is we hardly spent any time. These were pretty bad drawings. These are blind contour drawings, a little bit of color and, uh, you know, in a Wirmo and bubble letters here, and then, um, doing the actual practice of writing down the questions. I, I am like kind of surprised by how visually, uh, appealing this this composition is just from what we slap together right now. So I think that this is like a really interesting thing for you to notice, especially if you're kind of intimidated by nature journaling plants or you're new to nature journaling in general, is that there's a couple things you can do that are going to make your page look good without putting a lot of pressure on any single drawing. And um, just being a beginner, this is like very, very accessible. So that is um uh that is some encouragement right there and right now guess what we're going to talk about a few more things that should be even more encouraging because we're going to talk about other options if you can't draw so i'm going to take these things off of here for now and i'm going to get some pressed plants out of my press and show you um, how simple that can be. So obviously this is something you could do. The most simple way you can do this is actually, and maybe I'll just do it here as an example in a very rough shod sort of way, but I'm gonna take a little bit of this really cheap tape. Ideally you would do this with a wider tape, but I can show you how easy it is right here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just tape this down without even pressing it. So this is like level one. OK, and um, I'll show you a more advanced one in a second. But I think it's good to start with um, the real basics. And these are plants. These California poppies were picked in my backyard. I think there are some regulations about not picking um, California poppies in wild places. Oh, and amazingly, um, I have this beer right here that also has California poppies on it. Mindy here has a lot of knowledge about this, so please share um, any information. We do have some amazing resources in the community, and it's always nice to to um, to see what people what people bring to the table. So this is the kind of thing you could probably just have in your pocket and really easily deploy. And I just want to point out that uh, being a little bit, the first time I saw this at first, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so hideous. And um, it looks like, you know, next thing you know, I'm going to be uh, gluing macaroni uh, collages onto my page or something like in kindergarten. But the first time I saw it, I did talk some poo poo. But then what I realized is that the people that are doing this, they're, they're, they're nature journaling with a level of, of courage and, and fearlessness that I want to be able to, to do that more in my nature journal. And I think being a little bit messy and trying something is a way better thing than being overly cautious and not trying something. And lots of people, lots more people have journals on their, on their table or on their shelves that are empty because they were too cautious then there are people who have journals filled with stuff that they regret so i don't think there's that many people that have journals full of drawings and and glued in bugs and taped in things who who actually like regret that they did those pages i think there's more people who didn't fill any journals at all that have regret uh, i might be totally off on that but so trying something like this or just knowing that it's possible I think is is really cool. So look at that. How easy was that? And that's the kind of thing with some packing tape, it would have been even faster. Good tips, good tips right here. And one thing that I like to do is carry a little bit of, um, like I think in this journal, I have some of this, um, some of this paper right here. You could cut a little square of that and, and tape it down. It's also a fun way to start making 
your um, journal more three-dimensional. I think that's something that people uh, don't really do very much of, which could be really powerful. Uh, you can have little pages with things hidden underneath. Like I think I did one like that a few days ago. So here, for example, you could have like a page that flips open like that and get a little bit more junk journal, sort of art journal type techniques in here. Um, I'll talk about that more at the end of this video. But having a piece of wax paper like this could be a useful thing to do. And then you could just tape that there, um, especially if this were like just glued down or something like that to protect that. So having that as an option is a good, good idea. But right now let's pull something out that's already been pressed for a while and use that. So I've shown you this press before and it's gone through multiple iterations. I have these straps on it right now. I've gone through phases of being like really addicted to pressing plants and then stopping for a while. Uh, one thing that I think is, is pretty common is to once you make your system more advanced and you like buy stuff to make it bigger than or make it more serious, then you stop doing it. So one thing you could do is you could just get a um, you could just get a clip like this and a small sketchbook like this. And you could just squeeze plants into something like this and use some of these clips and hold it. And you could have you could have a plant press that is that simple. This is a little bit more involved and it's not always better because now I have to carry this huge thing around with me if I'm going to press plants. And there's there's definitely a downside to that. So let's see what if we can find something cool in here and, and use it right now today. Because this is an option for nature journaling plants if you don't feel comfortable drawing them. This is perfect, actually. I have some tweezers somewhere, but I'm just going to pull these out. And you can be, Mindy is going to explain, like, for example, how she's, like, way more precise. Like, I didn't even record the locations of these, these things, so I'm not doing it in a very scientific way. Uh, that is up to you. And I think the important thing is to understand that there's a lot of directions that you could go with this. I should just take all of them. There's a lot of directions you should you can go with this, and I don't want you to think that there's only one way to do it. So like if getting all of the like precise information about the location and doing it in a very scientifically rigorous way um, doesn't sound appealing to you, that's fine. You don't have to do it that way. All right, so now that I got what I want out of here, I'm just going to move this whole thing. Um, these straps do give you some amount of, I wouldn't call it mechanical advantage necessarily, but uh, you do, you can sort of leverage it a little bit to squish the pages, but there are other ways you can get mechanical advantage. This came with screws, but the screws were so slow. It took forever. It was not functional at all. So now what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to glue this in and all I have here is a cut off bottom of like a, a milk container. You can get some really cheap brushes for this and I'm going to use PVA glue. And a lot of people, uh, I used to use Mod Podge and when I was first learning about this and people were telling me, oh no, Mod Podge isn't good for that, blah, blah, blah. So I don't use Mod Podge anymore. And this PVA glue is archival. So that's a good thing, right? That means that in 500 years, people will be able to look at these uh, junky pages. Okay, so I'm going to, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to pour a little bit of this PVA glue into this cutoff thing here. And I'm mainly, what I'm trying to do is empower you to show you how some of these options are really easy. And if you feel like you can't draw, you can still nature journal plants and that there's a lot of options. I'm trying to keep it really simple 
um, like as simple as possible. I don't think I washed the brush well enough last time. So this is just straight. I haven't added water to it or anything. Now I'm going to grab my plant. Can't find my tweezers right now. I think playing around with pressed plants in your nature journal, even if you're not being scientifically rigorous, has a lot of benefits. And I think that um, it makes you think about the plants differently. And I think it can also help you learn about composition, which is something you probably already know I am very interested in and adamant about. If you can understand composition more and have more practice with composition, then you can make your um, drawings look better before you even start drawing. So I didn't even lose any of those little purple flowers. Knock on wood. Rubber bands is a good, is fast. That's a, uh, that's smart. Yep, that's a great strategy. I think, you know, like even a small paperback novel um, could be really cheap and a really great way to have something that could fit in your pocket and, um, and provide a lot of the functions. So I think these things, understanding sort of what some of the principles are and why you're choosing which tool is really important. And I, I, I think that sometimes we assume like, oh, a flower press has to look a certain way, but then we don't. And then later we might blame ourselves for not doing very much, using it very much, but it could just be the setup doesn't work very well for us. Yeah, this is a great strategy too. And I think I had some examples of that somewhere that I might have lost. Um, let's see, I know I have a good example. Here we go. I really like the way this one came out. It was on like a piece of an old book. Speaking of using old books, and I just glued this single salvia flower, and it has the page number on there, which I thought was kind of cute as well. So um, you can glue them onto scrap pieces of paper and have some of these around and then use them later. That would be a really great thing to put into. Um, I'm going to talk about this more later, but there's ways you can put envelopes in the back of your easily create an envelope in the back of your nature journal. And you could have things like this that are pre-made um, and save them in there. So there's basically a lot of different things you can do with this stuff. I'm going to put one um, finish layer over the top uh, to, to seal them in with the PVA glue. Now that they've set down a little bit. Might need a little bit more glue. It's possible to leave them uncovered, but with small flowers like this, um, I like to cover it. Also, I don't have any very old journals. I haven't been gluing flowers and plant matter into my journals for very long, so I don't know what this is going to look like in three years. But if you worry too much about what your journal is going to look like in three years, you might not do any journaling right now. And I guarantee you that in three years, if you have a journal that has some um, pages that are slightly discolored from, from plant matter or something not being archival, I think you're not going to have too many regrets about it. I think you're going to be more excited just to have that journal page with some cool plant matter stuck into it for the memories. All right, now I need to remember to wash that off later. But that's just showing you that that's a really simple way to work. Um, one other thing that I'll mention briefly is um, tracing and shadows. So this is a really good strategy if you're worried that you can't draw. Um, you can do. There's a lot you can do with tracing and with shadows. So if you sit um, in the right place on the right kind of day, you can get cast shadows from a plant, and you can easily draw 
those cast shadows on your page. So that is a strategy. You can also do, um, what I say, tracing or shadows. Okay, so that's one. And then the next one, this is kind of crazy. Oh, well, here, let me mention this one um, while I'm here. These are the sun print kits. Uh, haven't explored with them enough. I still haven't totally figured it out. Um, but basically, you get this cyanotype paper. Maybe we can actually make one while we're sitting here. There might be enough light. You can do it with artificial light, too. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, this is the kind of thing you could glue into your nature journal later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of these ones that would be really hard to draw, like this fennel, maybe. This would be really hard to draw. Oh, look at the caterpillar fell, or a caterpillar fell right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this on the paper like that. And then I'm going to, I think this is supposed to go on top to hold, hold it flat. And now I'm going to just put this sort of out of the way for a minute and see if the print comes out. It's not very sunny right now, but I'll put it down here on the shelf and see it's, if I remember, don't let me forget before the end of the show to check on that. Um, so that's one. And now I'm going to show you a crazy one. I can't use it right now because I'm on my phone, but the, I'm using my phone for recording this video right now. But this printer right here is a Bluetooth printer. And you can just take photos of plants and print them on here. So then it turns into a sticker and then you can glue it into your nature journal. At first, I thought this was crazy. Let me know in the comments if you think that is cheating. But here is an example of one that I did. And I think that I would rather, you know, sure, it'd be cool if I painted this landscape, Ito, but I sure do like that I could just print it off of this little pocket size printer from a photo on my phone and just stick it into my journal in less than five minutes. Um, that's kind of crazy. I first learned about that on a nature journaling trip um, in Ecuador. And um, one of the participants daughter came along on the nature journaling trip and she said, Oh, I can't nature journal. I can't nature journal. But she did have one of these and she would just print out photos um, and glue them into her nature journal and then write next to them. And I think that is pretty amazing. I'm going to do a whole video about that more uh, in the future. Okay. Next thing is capturing scale. Let's talk about this really quickly. And I think we're going to use um, this plant right here. Actually, I'm going to need to break some of that off if I may. So we're going to talk about scale, capturing the scale in your drawing. Because right now, even with all of this here, there is no scale. So we don't really know how big those plants are. And when you're nature journaling plants, it's really useful to show scale. So let's see how fast and how simple and how creative we can be in incorporating scale to show the size of a plant. So I'm going to do a really brief drawing of one of these ones that we looked at before. One of these flowers right here. This is a pomegranate plant and then some of the basics of the way the branch goes. So I see the branch has these opposite leaves. So I'm just going to do sort of the normal thing that you might automatically do if you looked at a plant and you thought, oh, I'm going to nature journal that plant. It's sort of like a species profile. It, it can be sort of the, the easiest or the most boring kind of type of nature journaling. So hopefully you'll branch out a little bit from that, no pun intended. And that is basically their opposite leaves. They're sort of pokey there at the tip. That looks about right. I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to draw this little thing very loosely next to it because I know now from experience that these are actually kind of hard to draw. And these are both to scale. These are at, at size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write actual size next to them. That is one way to, one really easy way to get the scale 
in your nature journal. The next way would be to, um, to actually draw something. So say if I drew this flower bigger than it really is, I think that's a flower. If I drew it like this big, So see how big it is there. What I will do is I'll measure it here and it's about three centimeters long. So I'll just put a scale here and write three centimeters. So that's two ways to do it. Now my last way and favorite way. Oh yeah, that's good. One to one. Um, that is a really good point. Talking about ways that you can abbreviate things. That's way faster than writing out actual size. Um, I will put a link to the um, the little printer because it's super cool and a really fun way. Like if all you had, for example, mom, is on your upcoming trip is if you had a little thing like this and this little this little printer, you could print photos of the people that you're with and the places that you visit and you could just stick them because they come out on a sticker paper. You could stick them in there and have a really nice keepsake. So let me just quickly grab that that link because I think that's something that other people will be interested in. And I'm really excited about it. So here is the link to that printer. Um, This is a Amazon affiliate link, so I will get a small percentage if, if people shop using that link. Um, Amazon's not my favorite company in the world, but it is one of the few ways that I can make a little bit of money from the this YouTube channel. So um, I understand if you don't want to purchase from Amazon, a lot of people already do, and it's um, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. So I know that I. I did dump um, Jeff Bezos and stop doing Amazon affiliate links for a while, but I did restart doing it again because it's one of the few ways that I can actually make money um, right now. So I, I started it up again. So this way of showing the scale is to draw a little person next to like what the bush looks like. So you can see there I did this little figure. I highly recommend kind of practicing a system like this where you can show it could also be an animal, you know, so like if there is a um, like what, what, what would there be like a, a turtle right here or something, a tortoise? You could uh, just show how big it is by putting it next to a person. So I highly recommend um, that technique and all that is doing is um, capturing the scale. So the next thing we're gonna do is zoom in, zoom out. So um, as I mentioned before, this lens right here um, is really great for that. And I'll might as well put the, the link for that. I learned this originally from Akshay. And it's $40. You get two different things actually. You get a um, wide angle lens, but you also get this one, which is the uh, macro lens. So it's really, really good for bugs and stuff like that. And for the amount of money, it's really, um, I think it's really affordable. And it also makes it so I'm less worried about damaging this while I'm out in the field. You can clip it onto the lapel of your shirt or your nature journal bag strap and then easily clip this onto your camera. So let's zoom in right now. And this is a classic nature journaling strategy. So what I'm actually going to do is there's a few ways you can do this um, in an aesthetically pleasing kind of way with like an arrow and a blow up box. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was the first one that did this, but I'm just going to make a little square right here. And I'm going to try to look into there and draw a close up of what I see inside of there. The lighting's not that good, but let's see if the autofocus, there we go. 
this is so much better than when the other uh, webcam that I used to use. So let's see if we can just draw a little bit the inside of what's going on in there. It is rather complicated. So maybe one strategy would just to be pull out an individual one of those thread like things. You can estimate how many times you magnify it by as well. I did do a whole episode on nature journaling things, nature journaling microscopic things, which was really fun with, um, I want to say Kristen Antonio Romero was her name. She's a biology teacher and she does a lot of stuff with microscope. So this is zoomed in right there. So just knowing that you can zoom in and zoom out, we already changed scale here, but being able to zoom in and zoom out, this is a classic thing to do if you're nature journaling plants. So let's see if we can just clip this lens onto the um, camera real quick and actually zoom in a little bit on, oops, looks like I covered the wrong one. Okay, that looks about right. So let's see what happens if we get really, really close in there. So look at that. And I'm not even using any of the focus tools right now, but you could zoom in even more besides that. And if you're nature journaling plants like in your backyard or house plants, this would be a really great tool to find wonder in even small, uh, small stuff in your backyard. So if all you have are so-called boring plants, zooming in is going to allow you to find wonder in anything. Like if you had a microscope, you wouldn't even need to leave your house to find really cool wilderness to nature journal. Okay. So a couple more things that I want to go over here for nature journaling plants. And while this is drying, I can't really turn the page. So I'm running out of space just a little bit. Uh, but this, one, I can give this example without um, drawing anything new. So one thing that I'm going to talk about here is botany counts. So it matters if you're nature journaling plants to know a little bit about plants because then you can pay attention to what matters and not pay attention to what doesn't matter. So for example, if you were drawing, ooh, look, there's another bug inside of this one, I think. Look at that. So if you were drawing a bunch of these flowers right here, or if, if you were drawing one, it would be really important for you to get the right number of petals. So on certain, on certain flowers and certain plant families, it wouldn't be that important to get all the petals. And so if you were just doing a quick drawing here, um, which I often end up doing when I'm in the field, I might just be sort of fudging certain things, you know, on um, a flower because I'm just doing a bunch of flowers really quickly. In the case of this plant, uh, getting the right number of petals is actually important and characteristic. So knowing so sort of what are some of those things that actually matter and what things you can fudge. On this plant, however, um, this is Popoveraceae, the, the popover family, a uh, poppy family. It's the California poppy. I'm pretty sure they always have four petals. Uh, I definitely wouldn't just start fudging the, the the number of petals. However, on something like this, this is from an aloe vera. It's in the asparagus family, the lily family. And as far as I can tell, they often have a whole bunch of flowers on them. And getting these exactly right, like to the number, is not going to matter. You could totally fudge that in your drawing, just like we did with our blind contour drawings. So knowing a little bit of botany does make a difference. Another thing that is really important to pay attention to and not fudge is whether the leaves are op opposite or alternate. So here, for example, with this um, strawberry guava, you can see that one leaf comes out on this side and right across from it, another leaf comes out and same down here. So if you're drawing this plant, even if you're in a hurry, you better not draw it like this, okay? If you draw it like this, it's totally wrong and it actually matters, okay? So there's certain things that matter and there's certain things that don't matter 
and learning even just a little bit about botany will help you uh, when you do that. And you'll always be able to recognize someone who just drew it. It could be like a, a very, very detailed, polished painting of a strawberry guava plant. But if the person doesn't show that the leaves are opposite, that is a botanically naive drawing and it's fine in some ways. But I think if you're trying to give respect, if you're going to do that much, you know, wet on wet technique and make a polished painting, you, you better get the, the leaves, whether they're opposite or alternate, you better get that part right. Um, okay, so a couple, I'm going to talk about a couple specific nature journaling strategies that are great for working on plants. Um, I'm just going to go through them quickly. I have other videos where I talk about them more. There's a nature journaling technique called doing a collection. A collection would be a great thing to do with for nature journaling plants. Uh, you basically go through and look at a bunch of different plants and collect them all on one page. So this, for example, with these pressed plants, multiple species of pressed plants found in a meadow. That would be a collection. You can do a string safari especially in a meadow where the plants are small, you tie a, a, a string into a circle, you put it down somewhere in that meadow, and then you nature journal what's in there. That's a great strategy. Collection, string safari. What, what other strategies do we have here? Um, post in the comments what your favorite nature journaling strategy is for plants. Ooh, this is a good one. Good, good tips from Ivea and from Mindy. Um, okay, curiosity wander. This is probably what you do already. It's when you just go out and you walk around and you nature journal when you find something that you're curious about. Super easy one. Joint comparison. This is when you put two plants side by side or two other things and you compare them. It's a really great way to make more in-depth observations. Like if we had two different types of of native poppy species or just poppy species in general and we drew them side by side great strategy pollinator survey sit next to a flower and pretend like you're drawing the flower and then whenever pollinators or bugs show up draw them that pollinator survey is a great strategy it could just be like you know you're doing this in-depth drawing of the plant getting all the details while you're sitting there and then over here, you just have this list with these little like stick figures of what the different um, birds, bats, uh, bugs that come. And you just have these little simple notes or drawings. So a pollinator survey could look just like that. That's a great one. Maps. How can you use maps to show where the plants are growing, where they aren't growing? Nature journal. If you're going to nature journal plants. Um, using maps would be great. And there's a variety of things you can do for homework. One would be to use an application like iNaturalist. You could check out some of these books that are being mentioned. What can you do? You can study your pressed plants when you get home. What would be a homework strategy for when you get back from the field for following up on your nature journal pages, how to nature journal plants using homework. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about a couple ways to motivate so motivating with your nature journaling, with your art, with anything is super important. And I think starting with your intentions. Why do you want to nature journal plants? Um, thinking about why you want to nature journal the plants before you start doing it is really important because um, otherwise you won't know how to decide if you're doing a good job or not. Um, so if you want to learn more about plant families, for example, that would be a, an intention. And if that is your intention, that might direct you in certain ways with your nature journaling. If you just want to create beautiful art, maybe all you want to do is create beautiful art. You don't even care what, what species or family or anything the plant is. You don't want to write anything down. That would be a different intention. So setting your intentions is going to help with your motivation. It's going to help you learn faster and be happier. Um, and then next, I think figuring out what your juice is, what kinds of plants or what kinds of techniques really get you excited. Does a plant press just look really fun to you? Do you just want to do it because of that? 
or are you just really juiced about succulents? If you are, plant press might not be the best thing. There's probably other things that you could do with these. If that is your juice, figure out how to use that to keep motivating you. Cross training is another one. What kind of cross training can you do that will help your nature journaling plants? Can you go on some plant walks? Can you learn about gouache? And can you learn about some other artistic techniques that will help you? That would be cross training. Could you do some gardening? What if you combined nature journaling and gardening? That would be cross training as well. Buddy up. This is another great motivation. Find another person to do it with or a group of people. If there's a botany club, maybe go with them. Bring a really small sketchbook like this. You could even use that, that photo, photo technique. And just as you go with the botany group, um, take photos just like everybody else in the botany group is doing but you're printing them out and gluing them into your sketchbook and writing some notes next to them, um, your nature journaling now. And that, because you're with a group of people, because you're buddied up, it's going to help you a lot more. And then last but not least for motivation, I think it's really important to nature journal things that we have a connection to. So eat what you're nature journaling. You eat a lot of plants every single day. Your life depends on plants. Your life is completely dependent on plants and um, you know, all of the, almost all of the like isotopes and molecules in your body came through plants at some point. So, um, find ones that you're connected to something that you're going to eat, something that you, you use every day and nature journal that. So try to connect with the plants that are connected to you. And that's my last tip, but I'm going to just check this cyanotype paper before signing off here and see if we got an image at all. Um, this is not completely dry yet, so I can't fully turn the page. Sometimes you can put something big like that and turn a page without getting it glued down, hopefully. So let's see here if this did anything. Nope, not enough light. But if I put this right under the lamp or left it out for a few hours more, even with this dim light, that would work. And I'll post a link to the cyanotype paper later, but thanks everybody for joining in. Those are some tips for nature journaling plants. Um, around this time next week, I think I will be in the Galapagos. So not sure if I'll be going live or posting a pre-recorded video, but bear with me. I'm going to be teaching nature journaling at a school and creating some fun content, especially for my Patreon patrons. So um, sign up on my Patreon for as little as $5 a month, you can get behind the scenes access, including um, essays and dispatches from the Galapagos that are just for Patreon members. That was really fun last year. And um, thanks for joining in everybody and see you next week. Bye.